Today, once again, I want to direct your attention to 2 Timothy chapter 4 as we continue our series on sound doctrine. My subject this morning, the baptism in the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. The baptism in the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. Throughout the book of Acts, the Bible teaches that the early Christians were filled with the Holy Ghost. They spoke in tongues, or either it is inferred that they spoke in tongues throughout the Scriptures. This is the Pentecostal pattern as it is given in the Bible. Now, when you get saved, you get the witness of the Spirit. The Bible says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And then we studied last week that you're to be cleansed. That's the negative side of sanctification where the old man is put to death. He is crucified. And then we're to be sanctified, which means to be made holy or set apart unto God, where you put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. And today, we have come to the baptism in the Holy Ghost. As I said, when you got saved, you got the witness of the Spirit. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, we are the children of God. So if you are saved, you have the Holy Ghost the witness of the Holy Ghost. But there is the baptism in the Holy Ghost where you are filled with the Spirit. You're submerged in the Spirit. And we've been singing about him this morning, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not an it. He's not an experience. He is a person, the third person of the adorable Godhead. We studied that in Article 4, the person of the Holy Ghost, and I preached an entire sermon on him. But the Pentecostal pattern is that when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you will speak in other tongues and unknown tongues as the Spirit of God gives you the utterance. And in this sermon, I hope to show the difference between the sign or the initial evidence of, of the baptism in the Holy Ghost as a sign you speak in tongue, and then the gift of the Holy Ghost where you uh, the gift of tongues where you speak in tongues and then there's interpretation. And the sign that you have been filled, the prayer language is what you experience when you receive the Holy Ghost. And this is given to build up or to edify the believer. So tonight I'm going to preach a sequel to this, You Need the Holy Ghost. So come back and hear that. But the gift of tongues with the gift of interpretation of tongues it is given to build up the church or the body of Christ, to edify. Now, doctrine is important, as I have repeatedly said over and over in these sermons, that it's important what you believe and why you believe what you believe. The Scriptures, the Word of God, are the basis of our doctrine and not what this denomination teaches. Let me say that again. The scriptures are the basis for our doctrine, not what a denomination teaches. There are some denominations, you know, that they teach things that are contrary to the scriptures simply because they think certain things end it. If the denominational teaching does not line up with the Word of God, then those teachings are in error and not the Bible, okay? There are some who will tell you that they believe that the Scriptures are the inerrant, infallible Word of God. That word inerrant means that they are free from error. The word infallible means not capable of being wrong or making a mistake. So while there are some in the body of Christ who teach that the Bible is inerrant and infallible, they deny certain doctrines such as the baptism in the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. And some of the same people, they also deny divine healing, as in the atonement. They say that tongues are not for the day and that divine healing and the gifts of the Spirit, that they ended when the last apostle died. But we know better than that because we see the gifts of the Spirit in operation here. We see miracles. We see people healing, heal. And we see God doing signs and wonders in our midst. Amen? Amen? So while there are some that teach these other things, we're going to teach the Word of God. Some of these people deny certain things. And I hope to correct 
Some of these errors, as we continue to study sound doctrine, and it is found in the Word of God. If it's in the Word of God, it's sound doctrine. If it's not in the Word of God, and some denomination says this ended because of what they said in some seminary, that is not sound doctrine. I'll go with the book. Paul, in writing to young Timothy, gives him the following instruction, 2 Timothy 4 and 2. We've used this repeatedly as our text. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They'll turn away from the truth and shall be turned into fables, okay? So today I want to continue our series on sound doctrine in this study. We have been reviewing the 14 articles of faith of the International Pentecostal Holiness Church and how they relate to the scriptures. Today I want to cover Article 11, the baptism in the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the ability, Lord, to look into the Scriptures and to see what the Holy Ghost is saying to the church and to rightly divide the Word. Lord, you said study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Lord, so we come again, Lord, thanking you for the cross, thanking you that you sent the Holy Ghost, thanking you that he is the great teacher. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to eliminate, to, to illuminate, Lord, our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Article 11, the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. If you would flash that up there. Quote, I quote our article. We believe that the Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire is obtained by a definite act of appropriating faith on the part of the fully cleansed believer, and the initial evidence of the reception of this spirit is speaking with other tongues as the spirit gives the utterance, end of quote. Now, I went back and I explained why we have the cleansing and why we have sanctification. We believe that this great blessing, which provides endowment with power to witness for Christ, is available to those believers whose hearts have been cleansed from sin by the blood of Jesus. Now, when you got saved, your salvation began. Part of your sanctification experience began. You started a journey. And Paul, in the book of Hebrews, he talks to us about, let us go on to perfection. And what I'm doing in these last days is teaching Bible doctrine. I'm teaching that and I'm showing you the work of the cross and that just like you were saved by believing in the cross, everything that you will ever get from God comes from the cross. God so loved that he did what? He gave. And on the cross, Jesus paid redemption's price. I was meditating and on because I, I read where one man said that he, he was a great man of God. He said, I did not understand sanctification as a work of the cross. And when he said that, I, I pinned down it's a second definite work of grace. Well, I was taught that, but guess what I wasn't taught? Sanctification is a second definite work of grace of the cross. Now, I believe the men that penned those words uh, that sanctification is a second definite work of grace, they understood that. But you know, I, I, I know everything comes from the cross, but I was not able to explain to you what the Holy Ghost whispered in my ear just the other day. He said, sanctification is a second definite work of the grace of the cross. So everything you ever get from God, if you need healing, it will come from what Jesus Christ did at the cross. If you ever get away from the cross, you have begun to do what you do in your self-righteousness, and you have left 
What God will honor, that is faith in the blood of Jesus. God blesses the church because they believe Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he sent the Holy Ghost to the church to empower the church. So we believe that the initial or the first evidence of the reception of the baptism in the Holy Ghost is speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. We do not believe that this is the only evidence of the, the Spirit's baptism, but that it is the initial evidence, just as it occurred repeatedly in the accounts in the book of Acts as the Spirit of God being poured out. I, I can take you, anybody, any doctor, any theologian that would love to go through the book of Acts, I can set him down, and with my layman uh, experience, in studying these scriptures, I can show him what the scriptures say if he has a mind to learn what the Bible has to say about it. But we believe that the initial evidence was speaking in tongues is for everyone who receives the Pentecostal baptism, and we distinguish between the initial manifestation and the gift of tongues, which is not given to everyone. When you receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost, the Pentecostal pattern is you will speak in tongues. That does not require interpretation. It is a sign that you have been filled with the Spirit of God. When you stand up in a church assembly such as this and you give out a message in tongues, that message requires interpretation and it should be interpreted with the sister gift of tongues. Now, the gift of prophecy is when you supernaturally speak in a known language to the body of Christ, something that edifies, exhorts, or comforts. That's all that prophecy, the gift of prophecy does. 1 Corinthians 14, 4, it edifies, it builds up, and it comforts. The prophet is a seer. That is a five-fold ministry gift. He sees the future. He operates in the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. He is a prophet sent by God, anointed by God to stand in that office. He's not great because of who he is. He's great because of the gift that God has given to him. And you and I, we're not great by anything we've done. We're great because of Christ and the cross and what he has done to lift us up out of darkness, translate us into the kingdom where we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness. Is, I'm preaching a whole lot better than you praising right now. Glory to God. I mean, I'm preaching a whole lot better than I hear what something coming back at me. Now, Pentecostal preaching should ignite your heart. Amen. I know I'm teaching, but it should ignite your heart. You should pull the preach out of the preacher, and I should pull the praise out of the people. That's what Pentecostal preaching is. That's why the Holy Ghost was sent to the church, so you and I can get in the flow, the river of God, and what God is doing. And some of you, you just need to get into the flow. I know you might feel bad, but I promise you, I've come up here sick many times. And I say, I know one thing. When I get up there, he's going to get up there with me. I didn't choose to do this thing. He called me to do it. And if you You'll find your place in the body of Christ, and you'll start operating where God has placed you. I promise you something. The anointing will come on you, and you will be, whoa, lifted up. Go on, praise him. I say you'll be lifted up and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost is very important because this is the day that the early church was baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Look at Acts 2 and 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Thank you, brother. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. The posture of prayer is they were sitting, just like you are sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set upon each of them, and look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. After Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus uh, was appearing. At one time, he appeared to more than 500 people. So the resurrection was no secret. Amen. He was appearing. Jerusalem was filled with excitement. Strange things 
had been told about the resurrection and strange things had been told about Jesus making his personal appearance to disciples and others during that time. And then there were the 120 disciples who were assembled in the upper room. These disciples were gathered there because the Holy Ghost had been promised. He was promised. He is the spirit of promise. Amen. So listen to some of these scriptures. John the Baptist said, John 3 and 11, look at it. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, the shoes whose latch I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. Cloven tongues like as what? Fire set upon each of them. Now, Jesus never baptized anyone with the Holy Ghost while he was on this earth. But on the day of Pentecost, that prophecy was fulfilled. The Spirit and the fire of God fell from heaven. Our God is a consuming fire. He is fire from his loins up. He is fire from his loins down. And he wants his church to be filled with Pentecostal fire. Amen. The Spirit had been promised, and these disciples were not disappointed. Listen to some of these scriptures regarding the descent of the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist stated that the Spirit had told him. Look at John 1.33, the middle part of that verse. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. I'm trying to build a foundation for you. So when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the heavens blasted open, the Holy Ghost floated down out of heaven and lighted upon Jesus. So Article 1 says we are Trinitarians. So in this baptism of Jesus, we see the Son being baptized. We see when he come up out of the water, the Holy Ghost descending from heaven in the form of a dove, and we hear the Father speaking, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So right there, you have the Trinity. Glory to God. God is working to build you and to build me into the edifice, the body of Christ, strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Amen. So John was able to identify Jesus as the one who would baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. The Spirit had told him. Then Jesus said, look at John 7, 38. Jesus said, he that believeth on me as the Scriptures, as the book, the Bible has said, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. You see that? But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should. Oh, have mercy, my, my pointer's not working. Those batteries, they're good when they work, hallelujah. But you can read it. Should receive. So the Holy Ghost is not an ap option. The baptism is not an option. Come back tonight, and I'll preach to you. And we'll lay hands on you. How did they get the Holy Ghost in, in the early church? Through the laying on of the apostles' hands. We will lay hands on you. Uh, uh, years ago, I started operating in this gift, laying hands on people and them starting to speak in tongues. And, and uh, one of my brothers, we, we were preaching uh, evangelistically together. He said, you have a special gift from God, Jerry. I said, well, I found it in the Bible. And if you'll do it, I believe it'll work for you too. Amen. He told me later, he said, you have transformed my entire ministry. But what they did in the early church, we have the same authority the same power, the same anointing to do today. I know the church is in a lukewarm, Laodicean uh, condition, but that does not change the Scriptures. You can have all of God you want, and signs and wonders will follow you if you live holy, do what God has called you to do, and believe God. Go on, praise Him. Hallelujah. The book hasn't changed. Amen. Thank God for the church. Look at John 14. 26, this is Jesus again talking about the Holy Ghost. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now look at Acts 1 and 8. Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. That, that is 
the, you got the authority to use his name when you got saved. Signs followed them to believe in his name, the authority of his name. They cast out devils, lay hands on the sick, and do signs and wonders. But when you get the baptism in the Holy Ghost, you get the power of the Spirit. So the, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and here's the purpose of it. You shall be witnesses unto me. Every miracle gives witness to Jesus. Every healing gives witness to Jesus. Every salvation gives witness to Jesus. It's not just going out telling your story. You're going to be a witness because signs and wonders follow the preaching of the word. Amen. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. These are just some of the scriptural promises that they that were fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. So the baptism in the Holy Ghost, it was not something that took the early church by surprise. They were assembled in that little upper room, and they were fully expecting the descent of the Holy Ghost. Do you expect him to descend when you come to church? Okay? They weren't disappointed. The descent of the Holy Ghost was sudden. He hit that place like a rushing mighty wind, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. See, the Holy Ghost is a wonderful gift. He teaches us. He leads us. He guides us into all truth. He opens the pages of this book. He will whisper wonderful treasures to you, things that you'll never hear come out of my mouth because he can talk to you like no one else can talk to you. He knows exactly what you need. He can give it to you line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here and a little there. And all the time, he's building you up and strengthening you. He is a wonderful gift. He comforts. He endues with power from on high. And he carries on the work of the Lord through us. Jesus knew that we would face opposition in this world, so he sent the Holy Ghost to give us the power to overcome the opposition. He sent us the Holy Ghost to give us the power to live a Christ-like life. I cannot tell you what the Holy Ghost has meant in my life. He has shown me great treasures, things that I was never preached to and taught. He has opened the book up to me, and he'll do that for anyone. He said, ye shall seek me, and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. So listen to what the Spirit would say to the church. Amen. You know, when I first got saved, uh, I, I, I've never been one that would just sit and study Pentecostal doctrine and nothing else. Never. I looked into the body of Christ, and, and I began to see. I began to see the Nazarenes and their doctrines of sanctification, amen. The old teachers of the Wesleyan movement, sanctification. I, I, I began to look into the Baptists and to see that they were great in winning souls. And, and then I got mixed up with the Word and Faith movement, Lester Sumrall, Kenneth Hagen, and, and that, that group that uh, was Word-oriented. And, and then I had my Pentecostal background, but I never disassociated myself from the body of Christ because I have a reason for that. One day the, the Lord spoke to me. He gave me a great revelation, and I carried it to my daddy, and I said, Daddy, I've never been taught this. He said, Son, you have something from God. I don't know how you'll teach it there. And what he showed me was so profound. I said, God, I've never seen anything like this. He said, do you want to learn? I said, yes, Lord, I want to learn. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you need to be willing to change your mind about some things. I said, I thought I was taught right, Lord. He said, do you want to learn? I said, yes, Lord. He said, then you need to be willing to change your mind about something. See, there are some people, because of their doctrine, they cannot believe in the baptism in the Holy Ghost. They cannot believe in divine healing. They cannot believe in the gifts of the Spirit because they go with their doctrine, and, and we, we've gotten where the river of God was flowing free and clear 
early on, they, they've gotten down by the river and they've gotten away from the book and they say this doesn't exist and that doesn't exist. But I read the book. The book says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What he did before, he will do today. Well, he is a generational God. He is not a denominational God. Thank God for some good denominations. But let me tell you, he is a generational God. I'm thankful for my denomination that I have a covering. But I'm a whole lot more thankful for the book. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Glory to God. I'm thankful for the great teaching that others have given me. But if they don't line up with the Word of God, I'll tell you one thing. I'll turn my credentials in. Amen. Because I, I took a covenant that I believed our articles of faith. And long before I ever took that covenant, I didn't go to some college and, 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 and get some watered-down version of it. I had been along with God for 10 years studying this book, going back, looking at doctrines of different churches. I went through one of them and took 26 articles of faith till I finally found that error. It was long about article 22 and then at the end of it they said we have the right to change our mind as we get greater revelation let me tell you something here's the revelation right here you don't need to change your mind you need to get into the book find out what the book has to say amen I, i'm i never disassociated myself from the body of christ i, I went to a revival recently and, and i enjoyed worshiping with my brothers and sisters of, of like precious faith but they had a doctrinal difference and one man made a beeline to me and tried to shove his doctrine down my throat i said sir i enjoyed my worship with you but you and i don't see that the same he said well you need i said no i've studied the book and he just tried and tried to shove that down my, my throat. But finally I told him, I said, I love you, and I believe you're saved. I'm saved whether you believe it or not. I'll see you later. <laughs> Goodbye. And I just went on. Glory to God. Shouting, dancing, happy in the Lord, and the power's might. <laughs> Glory to God. I don't know how I got over there, but thank God anyway. The Holy Ghost is a wonderful gift. We cannot do the works of God or put the kingdom of God over in our human ability. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. He hit that place like a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, and they went out of that place and they began to preach and to project Jesus Christ. I believe they were reeling and rocking. I believe they were jerking <laughs> under the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe they were dancing and shouting with exuberant joy. People say, why do you believe that? Because everywhere I've ever seen the Holy Ghost poured out and revival spirit hit the church, that's exactly what they do. They get besides themselves. They get caught up into another world. They lose sight of this earth. Amen. And they get heavenly minded and they are caught up and seated together with Christ in heavenly places in the holiest of holies, the tabernacle in heaven. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. Now the Jews that were gathered there on the day of Pentecost, they said, what meaneth this? There has always been a confusing element about Pentecost. There will always be a confusing element. That's why the Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. The Holy Ghost will give you, when you're filled with the Spirit, and by the way, I've got sermons all over the place on the Holy Ghost. We need a constant refilling. Uh, you don't just get one filling, praise God. We go through the book. Some people got filled years ago. They don't even know whether the Holy Ghost is still in the tabernacle or not. They hadn't heard him speak lately. But you need to speak in tongues. You need to pray in tongues. And I'll cover some of that. Hallelujah. But there were, some said, what meaneth is others were mocking them, saying, these people are full of new wine. But Peter, under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, he stood up and he set things straight. He said, this is that which Joel spoke of. That in the last days, God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Peter preached to that crowd, and he said, these men are not drunk as you suppose. They are drunk, but they're not drunk as you suppose. And Peter preached to them and told them, 
This is that which Joel said would come. And he told them, you have crucified Jesus, but God has raised him up from the dead. And, and listen to this. And being raised up, Jesus having received. If you want to go back and study that on your own, look at Acts 2, 32 and 33. But being raised up, Jesus had received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He has sent forth this which you now see and hear. Peter let them know it was Jesus who did this. It was Jesus who made these people drunk. It was Jesus who gave them power from on high. It was Jesus who made them tongue talkers. It was Jesus who filled them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So if you want to blame anybody, if you're watching by live stream, if you want to blame anybody for tongues of fire and the Holy Ghost, blame Jesus because Jesus is the one who sent the Holy Ghost to the church. And when they got the Holy Ghost all through the book of Acts, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them nerves. Go on, praise God. Amen. See, I got some good news. I don't have any bad news. I don't have bad news. I'm not a bearer of bad news. I am a bearer of good news. Amen. We're in the last days, and that's good news. We're in the last days, and there are people departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But the good news is this. We're in the last days when God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. See, our God is a restorer. He promised in the book of Joel, he said, I will restore. I don't know how far you've ever been down in your life, but when I came to the Lord, I had to look up to see the bottom. But God spoke to me. He said, I'll give you a crash course, son. He said, I'll make it up to you. He let me know I'll restore all the revelation. I'll restore all that you could have had. If you'll come and walk with me, I will restore. He said, I'll restore the years, the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the worms of sin have taken away from you. You know, he promised that. And, and this world right here, we're just passing through. Our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven. And if anybody on this planet is going to be excited, it should be the church. Amen. We're living in exciting. Jesus said, don't rejoice because the devils are subject to you in my name, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Hallelujah. I, I can get happy. Be, no matter what happens to me, I belong to Jesus. And, and this was my last breath. I'm going to take a shortcut home to glory because Jesus has paid the price. I belong to him. You belong to him. Go on and praise him. I think we ought to stand and take a praise break because of what Jesus did at Calvary's cross. Our names are in the book. We've been redeemed by the blood. We are the body of Christ. God the Father loves us. He calls us his children. He invites us to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Don't let the devil beat you down. Punish him with your praise. I said punish the devil with your praise. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. He's worthy, worthy to be praised. He is the most high God. He is possessed of heaven and earth. He is a deliverer from every enemy that you will ever face. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The gifts of the Spirit belong to the church. And God wants everybody in every church, in every generation, in every denomination to have everything that's in the book. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I, I'm going to do it anyway. Somebody asked, do you have to speak in tongues when you get the Holy Ghost? No, you don't have to. You get to. It's like getting a new pair of shoes. If you can shoot that camera on my shoes, I got on a brand new pair of shoes. It's like getting a brand new pair of shoes. The tongues come with the shoes. And when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, the tongues will come with the package of being baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. Don't ever be ashamed of the Holy Ghost. Don't ever relegate him to some back room like some people do. 
Bring him right out, put him on display, and he'll do his work. Glory to God. Jesus said when he is coming, he will reprove the world of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. Jesus said he'll not speak of himself, but he will speak of me. He will speak of the work of the cross, and he will let you know what belongs to you as a child of God. Glory to God. He is the spirit of truth. He is a great gift from God. Hallelujah. God gave him to Jesus, and Jesus turned around and said, sent the Holy Ghost to the church. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus is the head of the church. Look at this, Mark 16, 17. He said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. One of the signs that's supposed to follow a believer is you are to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's a sign that follows you. The sign that you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. You speak in tongues. Hallelujah. So Peter preached the cross. He preached the resurrection. And the Holy Ghost gave witness and brought conviction upon that crowd. And the Bible says that these men that heard Peter, they were pricked in their heart. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. People did, Peter didn't tell these people to believe and be saved, no. He asked them to make a decision to repent of their sins. Amen. You, the Bible says, Godless sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation not to be repented of. Worldly sorrow worketh death. The churches of America, they have people sitting in their pews, and they have had worldly sorrow simply because they've been caught in something that was wrong. But when you do like old brother David in Psalms 51, he says, against thee and against thee only have I sinned. And you have godless sorrow. The Holy Ghost, he will, he's the hyssop. You know, in the Old Testament, they, they took hyssop and dipped it in the blood and put it over the doorpost. One on the left, one on the right, one in the sun, and it made a cross. He's the hyssop that applies the blood of Jesus to our heart. Hallelujah. Peter preached to them. And they got things right with God. And 3,000 souls were born again that day. Now, I want to talk very briefly about the gift of tongues. I've talked about the sign and the initial evidence. Now, we believe that the initial evidence of the baptism, according to the Bible, is speaking in tongues. But we distinguish between the initial manifestation and the gift of tongues, which is not given to every spirit-filled believer. Speaking in tongues when you are filled with the Holy Ghost is a sign that you have been filled with the Spirit. There is a difference between the sign and the gift. In every instance where people were filled with the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, go back and read it, they spoke in tongues or it is inferred that they spoke in tongues. On none of those occasions... Was there any interpretation required? And we don't have any examples in the Bible where they interpreted what was spoken. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they spoke in tongues, and that's it. It required no interpretation. Tongues were a sign that the believer had been filled with the Holy Ghost. The sign is universal. That is, all who are filled with the Holy Ghost will speak in tongues. I've been in other other countries. I've heard them speak in tongues. Amen. And glossolalia, that's what they want to call it, speaking in tongues, it sounds pretty much the same. In other words, I, I can go into one of their services and my spirit man lets me know you are among fellow believers. I've been in countries where I didn't even speak their language. But I had a language inside of me. Hallelujah. And my spirit bore witness with their spirit that we were all the children of God. So he is a universal God. A universal sign is the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we distinguish between the gift and the sign, however. The gift is given individually. Not all that speak in tongues have the gift of tongues. They have a prayer language, but not the gift of tongues. Not all spirit-filled Christians have the gift of tongues. 
They have that prayer language and where they speak supernaturally to God. Let me help you. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Okay? Speaking in tongues, our prayer language helps to strengthen or build up the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. That's why Jesus sent the baptism in this form. When you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you will speak in other tongues. And he is given to you to build you up. Jude talks about it. Jude said, Beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith. How, Jude? Praying in the Holy Ghost. So Paul talks about it. Jude talks about it. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifies the church. So tongues with interpretation is equivalent to the gift of prophecy. I'm not talking about preaching. I'm talking about uh, edification, exhortation, and comfort. When someone stands in the church and gives out a message in unknown tongues, it's not known to the hearers. Someone must have the sister gift to interpret it. And once they interpret it, let me, let me, let me get back to this and then I'll, I'll show you what, what happens. Paul speaks of the gift of tongues and interpretation, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. Look at this. To, look at the middle part of that verse. To another is given diverse kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. So if you have the gift of tongues and you went into an assembly and no one interpreted it, then you need to pray and ask God to give you the sister gift, the gift of interpretation. Because you can have all the gods you want. He, he's not going to hold back on you. There are gifts he gives, but you seek the giver. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Don't seek any experience. Seek Jesus. Don't ever get away from the cross. Go back to the cross. Go back to where you first met Jesus. Amen. Just Stay at the cross. Don't let, and, and after you get there and you make sure everything's all right between you and God, go on and be seated together with him in heavenly places. But don't let the devil get you to thinking you can do this in your strength. No. He'll get you over into works. That's what the nation of Israel, they, they, they had the gospel preached to them, but because of their unbelief. What brought their unbelief? The fact they got over into works. If you put your faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, Christ and the cross of Calvary, your faith will soar like an eagle, and you can call upon the Father, and the Father will give honor to the Son. Jesus said that he would bring glory to the Father because of the work of the cross. Hallelujah. Don't let the devil get you over into works. He does that to people in the church all the time. You're not good enough. Then he'll make you think you are good enough. I come to church. I pay my tithe. I preach. I teach Sunday school. It doesn't matter what you do. It's all what he did. And if you have a gift, he gave it to you. Go and praise him. Let's lift up Jesus in the house. Let's praise Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Pastor Nick. Hallelujah. The purpose of the gifts of tongues and interpretation is to take the message that was given in an unintelligible tongue and to make it known to the people that are present in the church. It's to make it understandable. When the message which was given in tongues is interpreted, that reveals that God has brought a special message to the church. So there are tongues as a sign that you've been filled, and there are tongues with the gift of interpretation. Tongues as a sign or your prayer language is to edify you. Look once again, 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Now look at the gift of tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. Paul said, I wish that you all spake in tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues. And a lot of people stop right there, except that be interpretation. <laughs> that the church may be edified. So when you... When you pray in an unknown tongue, you're not speaking to men. You're in your prayer chamber. You're talking to God. 
And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, and he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. When you're in the assembly and a message is given out and it is interpreted, that is to build up the body of Christ. One is to build you, the other is to build the body. Let us stand. Hallelujah. We believe in the initial baptism of speaking with tongues. We also differentiate between that and the gift. Hallelujah. Pastor Nick. Holy Spirit reigns
Jesus washes me. Go. Oh, the blood.